This week's bunker story is brought to you by Face Beef. A couple of days ago, I was on Face Beef when I noticed this quote: "The United States is third in murders throughout the world, but if you take out Chicago, Detroit, Washington D.C., and New Orleans, the United States is fourth from the bottom for murders." Believe it or not, these four cities also have the toughest gun control laws in the United States. So, under this quote, a few people had liked it, and then I made a、uh, what I thought was a humorous comment. I said, "I'm a liberal, therefore this is either one a lie, two it's far more complicated than that, and you are misrepresenting it, or three I don't care, guns kill." And a someone called Mark. I'm not going to give his surname. But someone called Mark came back and said, "Killers kill, not the weapon." And somebody liked that. And I responded to Mark, "You are wrong, Mark. Guns are designed to kill. Therefore, they kill. You have a right to defend yourself. Your best weapon is nine one one. In England, after calling the emergency services." We offer an attacker a nice cup of tea and perhaps some biscuits if we have any. To which Mark replied, "I don't want to get in a big debate here, Bernie. I respect both of our opinions." Today, I am broadcasting from a post on Facebeef. Life, liberty, and property. This is Bernie, and today we have another interview. This time it's with、uh, someone you probably already know. He's quite famous. He's、uh, a brilliant scholar,、uh, a very interesting man all round, actually, Stefan Kinsella. And、uh, I'm just going to go straight to the interview and let it speak for itself. So, hello, Stefan. Hello, Bernie. So we've been chatting back and forth on Facebook, and one of the things you said was that you were in London in the early nineties. Is that right? I was, and、um, from nineteen ninety, you know, the school year nineteen ninety one to ninety two. So for about a year,、uh, nine months or a year, I was I was there at, at、uh, King's College London, living、uh-huh. in student housing in Camberwell, and、uh, thoroughly enjoyed my year there. Camberwell, I know it well. Well, it's funny. I look at the maps now. I don't really know London because I just took buses and I just was going by point to point on the bu- on the map,、uh, you know, on the bus map, yeah, the bus schedule. And I really didn't learn the geography. I just knew where I was going, and I got there and, you know, did things in those areas. But、uh, yeah, it was a fun year. I loved it, loved it. And、uh, I took my son to London、um, about a year ago when I had to go to Turkey for Hans Hoppe's thing. So we. St- Stopped in London, and he just was in love with it. We saw the Tower of London, and you know the Tube, and、um, he's a he was ten years old. He was just enthralled. Wow, cool. So what's、um, what was this thing about Mad Cow? Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, I don't know what called that to my attention. I think I was I saw a a, a blood drive、uh, being advertised at my son's school, and、um, every time I see that, it gets me upset because、um, ever since I've lived in London, well, maybe for the last fifteen years. Um, if I try to give blood, they always reject me. Really? And yeah, so I'll go to give blood, and I've given up now because.、Uh, and so I'll, I'll go to apply, and they ask me the questionnaire, and everything is normal except, did you live in the UK for more than I don't know, three months or something like that in this time frame? And I did. And, wow.、Uh, they're worried about mad cow disease. Wow, that's extraordinary. I've never heard of that before. Yeah, so if you happen to have lived in the UK for more than a certain number of months, if you're an American、uh, back in the '90s, they will not let you give blood here because they're afraid of mad cow. It's crazy. Wow, that is extraordinary. I'm gonna have to check that out here and see if、uh, 
see if that applies here. I get the feeling it probably doesn't. <laughs> I don't know. The Americans are a crazy species sometimes. So they don't test for it. They just ask you. Kind of yeah, thing. they just ask you. You, you self-report, <laughs> and um, they say, well, you've lived in London, so or you've lived in England, so thanks, but no thanks. Okay. Well, uh, that's 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 wild, really wild. So you're a lawyer, and uh, one of the things I've heard you you heard you talk a lot about law, and and I've heard you talk a lot about IP. I've heard lots of your stuff for the last well, I don't know, several years. Um, and I really like what you say. I really like your your stuff, and I, I'm I'm very much with Hans Hermann Hopper myself. Mm-hmm. You work as a lawyer. I also get the idea that you actually. You have some love for the subject, right? I do love the subject, um, and I like the practice. Um, I've enjoyed many parts of the practice. Um, I did I did burn out a little bit on the drudgery of aspects of the patent practice after a good decade of doing it, um, and so I made some changes. But yeah, I like advising clients. I like working with engineers. I liked it when I did some family law and oil and gas law and other things earlier in my career. Um, I won't say I always wanted to be a lawyer because I didn't. It didn't even occur to me until I was in, in basically in graduate school in, in, in engineering. Really? Um, oh, yeah. I just did it to make money and because I like to argue and people said you should be a lawyer. And <laughs> that's not really a good reason. But um, I, it, it, for me, going to law school was like uh, – I loved engineering. I loved science and technology, but I was more than that right? because I was – reading economics and political philosophy and history and Ayn Rand and all that, and, and that is not the engineering way of thinking. It's just outside that box. We don't get exposed to any of that kind of stuff, really, as engineers. Right. Um, and so when I went to law school, I just felt uh, like a, a whole new world had opened up to me because you could think and talk in normal terms, maybe a little bit um, uh, specialized, but you could talk like a human, right? You're talking in humanistic terms about purposes and right and wrong and – and uh, so for me, it was liberating. Um, and um, I, th- I thought law and law school was analytical like engineering is. It's not empiricist, but it's analytical in terms of – in the sense that it's problem-solving. Yeah. So I liked it. Um, I enjoyed engineering and law, and uh, I liked being a lawyer. Um, I liked everything about it. I've, I've had a good, a good education and a good career. I really can't complain, and I've never been a whiner about that stuff. And you get to argue, right? Say again? You get to argue as well, right? Well, I never really did. I was not much of a litigator. Um, oh, okay. So I, I, I argue in my libertarian voc- avocation, you know, in my political writings. Uh, so I guess I've used some of that skill set there. But in my career, no, you don't argue that much. It's more transactional and applying for patents and giving, uh, doing contracts and giving people advice and helping them negotiate things. So there's really not much arguing for lawyers if you're not a litigator. I gotcha. um, Yeah. Okay. From a lot of um, <clears throat> talks I've heard you talk about, you, you've mentioned something like, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, the purpose of a court in the absence of a state would be to discover the law. Have I got that right? Yeah, that is one way I've tried to word it, trying to be careful there. Um, and uh-huh. I got that, um, coincidentally, I posted something on Facebook, I think today or yesterday, um, um about Rothbard's book review of Bruno Leone's Freedom and the Law. I saw um, the post, yeah. I think I'd read that a long time ago, but I'd forgotten Rothbard's exact words, and there was an audio version of it, so I listened to it when I was walking this morning um, and not smoking a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> um I we'll find that's funny. The, we'll get to the I, part I, later. I, I sometimes exercise, and I used to smoke a pipe and, or, 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 I mean, a cigar, and you have all these health nuts that look at you like you're insane because <laughs> what are you doing walking and smoking at the same time? Um, <laughs> but um, so from, from Leone, Bruno Leone has this wonderful book, Freedom and the Law, which Rothbard critiqued and praised. Um, and um, he emphasized – I don't know if he emphasized it. I got it from someone that I read, but I, I, tried, to, I tried to emphasize that law should be um, – we have two types of law now that yeah. the government, the state enforces on society. And one is basically made law, law announced by decrees of the legislature, which is what most people think of as law now. But the older way of law, the way law arose, it was, it was viewed as being discovered by judges. Yeah. Um, 
um, or by courts or by central decentralized uh, processes. And I say discover instead of made by judges because they viewed themselves as assuming there was a justice, a natural justice or a natural law out there that they were trying to figure out. Um, so they were discovering the law, not creating the law. I think that's fascinating and very interesting. Do you, do you know exactly where it comes from, or, or? no? I think Hayek. I think it's m- mainly from Leone, but um, uh, it, it is fascinating to me too. And one reason is because I am from Louisiana, mm-hmm. which is the only one of the fifty U.S. states which is a civil law system or a continental law, right? A Napoleonic Spanish law, French law, Napoleonic uh, code, uh, Spanish law hybrid system based upon the continental and the Roman law. So I was sort of reared in the Roman Spanish. French civil law tradition mixed in with the common law because Louisiana is surrounded by, you know, the other forty nine states which have the English style common law. Um, so it it really comes from a study of both of those two systems: the common law from England and the Roman law and its modern versions. Um, in which you know the serious scholars of it, when you study the way it works, the law is viewed not as being created or made, but it's viewed as being discovered and found in a process. Um, and also codified, is that right? Well, it was codified um, not until later. And that was more of a uh, that was uh, say Napoleon was one of the ones that started the modern codification process uh, in, the, in the Napoleonic Code, and it introduced an element of legis- uh, legal positivism in that the first few articles of the civil codes say that um, uh, legislation is the supreme source of law, and the following codified articles are law because the legislature is blessing them uh-huh. but what it but it, what it was was it was a carefully distilled summary of the principles that had been figured out by a decentralized non-legislative process in previous centuries so the legislature in the in the continental systems took decentralized law and they codified it with the help of legal scholars and then the legislator blessed it to sort of take supremacy. So it did introduce an element of legal positivism, which I would not agree with. But the the, the substance of the codes themselves are by and large um, fantastic um, private law uh, codifications. There have been other private codifications which have nothing to do with the legislature, like uh, the uh, Uniform Commercial Code in the U.S., uh, and the American um, – uh, the ALI, the uh, American Law Institute, restatements of the law. Uh, of course, Blackstone's uh, codes earlier on, uh, Blackstone's codification earlier on, and even just the Emperor Justinian's codifications um, earlier on, so uh, which did have a government aspect to it. But uh, yeah, there's lots of uh, role for legal scholars to codify, summarize, restate, reshuffle, slightly correct the law that develops in a sort of more, more organic. You could say Hayekian fashion. Leone was heavily influenced by Hayek, uh, and I think vice versa. I think he also influenced uh, Hayek. All right, that's that's really interesting. Maybe codifying wasn't quite the word I meant to use. I, I, I think what I was meaning to say was something more like um, setting precedent. Would that be right? Okay, so yeah, so so in, in the common law, the idea of uh, stere, stere decisis, right? The idea of precedent, the idea that um, a previous decision of the court is binding. Um, uh-huh. Although even that is exaggerated, uh, yeah. because on occasion courts will break from precedent and change the decision. But by and large, in the common law, uh, there's a great respect for the judicial role, and therefore the courts try to organically develop the law by working within the existing precedents. And if they come up with a new case. They have to reason by analogy between the previous precedents, and so the law grows organically. And if it's very similar to a previous case, which you think was decided wrongly, you have to do one of two things. You have to either explicitly say, I'm not going to follow precedent, um, or which is like basically overruling the previous court. Um, or you have to come up with some kind of reason that you distinguish the current case, and sometimes that's an artificial reason, and sometimes it's a legitimate reason. Um, in the civil law system, there's something analogous. It's called jurisprudence constant. That's a French term, I believe, or Latin. I think it's French. It means constant. constant. Ju- so the idea there is that you're not really bound by a particular holding of a previous court because they're all entitled to interpret the civil code as it's written because the legislature lays down the rule, 
and the court just applies it like an administrative function. However, if a long series of court decisions have always interpreted a given uh, civil code article in a certain way, then that has strong um, – uh, it has a strong persuasive effect on previous on, on succeeding courts, so it's similar to stare decisis or precedent. I, I wrote a long article on this in 1995 for the JLS Journal of Libertarian Studies, and I wrote an, a, a summary version of it in the meantime, and they're both on my website if anyone's interested. I, I, I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, most people just want to talk about intellectual property with me nowadays, so I rarely get to talk about this topic. <laughs> I've heard you talk about that many, many, many times. I, th I find it fascinating. You totally converted me on the subject. I was pretty much sticking with uh, – I mean I, I've, I've – uh, in the last 15 years at least, I've made – most of the money I've made has been through either software development or photography, both of which I heavily relied on copyright. So it was a big deal for me to look at and change, <laughs> uh, you know, having had some skin in the game kind of thing. I, I understand. I have skin in the game, too. I'm a patent attorney, yeah. so I, yes. I, that's why I struggle with it. But it, it for some people, it is hard to figure this out, um, and I understand that totally. It took me a long time to come, come around to my current view. Um, I do think that now the the more clear these issues are, and the more obvious the um, the obvious uh, injustices from the system, right? Trademark, patent, copyright. We hear about them every day. It's I think it's easier now for say newer libertarians who are starting to think about it. I think it's just easier to figure it out right away for at least some people. Yeah. Um, well, I didn't find it that way for me, but now in retrospect, it seems um, it seems easy. Yeah. When I've heard you speak about IP, uh, and I'm not going to talk about IP particularly, but w w you usually begin with, okay, what is property? Where does it come from? And uh, you talk about Lockheed and homesteading and uh, Hoppy's variation on that. And uh, so we so we, we begin with a, a discussion of property and uh, why we need property. Uh, and I find that fascinating and very, very uh persuasive the idea of we live in a world of scarcity we need to have some rules of some kind or other in order to decide who has control over what property at what time for what purpose etc yeah and uh are you still there yeah i'm here oh I'm sorry it's just so quiet such a good line this <laughs> i know i know uh i heard your last interview and you had some skype uh, with uh, nima vadati yeah that was awful <laughs> So far, we've been lucky. Not, not, knock on a socialist head, you know. <laughs> okay, so when we talk about property rights, do you actually? I mean, uh, uh, when, when talking about it with people, if you, depending on how deep you want to go with it, do you sometimes use your go with certain words just because other people understand them, even though you don't necessarily um, totally agree with, them? like the word rights, for instance. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. I do that sometimes, mostly in casual conversation. Yeah. Um, uh, in more intellectual settings with people that are really interested, like rising students or people in, a, in a, an interview or in a, in, a, in a lecture, I try to be precise. Or if I use a word in a different way, I try to qualify it sometimes. Um, and I've done that more and more in recent years. So on this issue of property um, – um, uh, I, I actually try not to say what is property because that's uh, – and last night I did a, a Liberty.me um, – this Jeff Tucker's do venture. I did a Liberty.me seminar on on libertarian confusions and clarifying terms, and one thing I've noticed is you have to be careful not only because of confusion of you know even ourselves on, on these issues, which are not easy, and um, and outsiders, uh, you know, say opponents. And, but people that are dishonest and disingenuous, or they will equivocate. So you have to be careful to not go with them when they set you up. You can tell, and sometimes they're doing it on purpose, and sometimes they're not. Um, on the IP issue itself, even libertarians will do this. They'll say, "Well, don't you have the right to the fruits of your labor?" Or they'll say, "Well, the question is, is an idea property?" And I don't think that's the question. I think if I, th I think that libertarians have a good intuitive sense of the way the system should work, given what we've had so far to deal with, you know, the existing, the pre-existing industrial age, which really wasn't too much of an intangible property issue, um, not a digital age issue. But now we're having to confront these other issues, and we have to be a little bit more careful with our application of these concepts. 
And so I never say, is that property or not? I step back and I wonder, where did, where did the word property come from? Why did we start using it? And if you go, if you go back to Locke, which is really the genesis of a lot of our ideas, um, he was talking about uh, what is, uh, who is the proper owner of something, who should properly be conceived of as the person with the right to control a given thing that there can be conflict over. Uh, which Hume pointed out as well, and which Hoppe emphasizes in his writings, right? So it's always a question about who has the, the legally recognized right to control a given scarce resource, something that people can conflict over. So the question is not, is that property? The question is, what is the resource that is at issue? What's right. the dispute over? And then who the owner of the re- who is the owner of that resource? So I always try to use the word resource now because – if you if you just use the word property and you refer to the thing, the resource that you have a property right in as property, then you lose sight of the fact that we're always talking about ownership of a given resource. Um, when you talk about it that way, it becomes pretty clear, at least for the libertarian, that there's only about two or three fairly simple rules which which answer that question when you apply them to the to the contextual facts at hand. And those are for the for the body self ownership, which is the person himself is the presumptive owner, and for everything else for external resources, it's either the the person who first started using it, you know, the the Lockean homesteader or the or the uh, the uh, the original appropriator, or someone that he transferred it to by contract, or that he owes it to in payment of a debt like uh, restitution or rectification for a crime or a tort or something like that, and other than that, basically. No one else has a, a better claim to that resource. So if you always focus on who owns the resource, you don't even get to these IP confusions because um, – l- let me give an example I've been giving lately. Um, people say that we fight over religion, you know, Muslims and Christians or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But they, they don't really fight over religion. They fight over physical things like their bodies or their land. The, the religion is maybe what motivates them to, to fight, but the fight is always over a scarce resource. Yeah. Okay. So the libertarian would say, well, the, the, the Christian, the Christian can't kill the Muslim who doesn't convert to Christianity, because the Muslim owns his body. So the property right is in the body, right? Or you can't steal their their animals or take their land or burn their crops or whatever because they own those physical resources. So if you put it in terms of the dispute is always about who owns a given resource. And you don't say, is that property or not? The question is, who has the property right in that resource? Then you also couldn't so easily make the IP mistake that people do when they say, well, you can own a, uh, a, a piece of land or a house or a car that you created with your labor, but you also can create ideas which are useful and valuable on the free market. And so you own things that you create. And so those things are property. So you see they have this kind of mishmash, this this sloppy terminology that lets them get down a rabbit trail of equivocation and um, and confusion. Yeah. Um, so if you just keep asking what's the scarce resource at issue and what are the libertarian principles that we're applying to determine who owns it, it's very simple. And then you'll see that the ultimate issue with IP is that your the, the state – or the legal system that you're favoring as an IP advocate is awarding the right to control or a property right in a resource that was already owned by someone else. You're awarding a, a right to control to someone else, even right. though there was no contract, there was no tort, and that other person didn't uh, find that resource. So there's none of the three libertarian principles that would justify giving them the right to control and to tell you how to use your own resources. And when you put it that way, it becomes pretty clear – in my view, that yeah. IP is nothing but uh, an evasion of property rights. Yeah. I've heard people uh, actually saying that creation is is another way of acquiring property rights. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a confusion because um, there, there is a link between the creation of wealth and property rights, but they're not the same thing. Yeah. Um, so I think you have to just be, again, clear with your concepts, your language, your terminology, and your analytical framework. Um, 
And also, I would say that, yeah, the hard thing is to make other people understand exactly what you're saying. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the struggle. I think the struggle is a pedagogical one, really. It's to yeah. get the ideas straight in your own mind yeah. so that, number one, you understand them and you have a, a clear, consistent way of thinking. And then you have to try to find a way to communicate them to people. And that that's strategy. That's that's pedagogy. That's uh, uh, it's a lot of uh, special skills and not everyone has it. Um, um but in, in the in, in this case, what I just typically explain to people is that you know if you own a resource and you transform it into something more valuable, you have you have increased your wealth because the thing you own is now more valuable to you or to potential customers or whatever. But you haven't created a new property right because you had to own the resource that you transformed before you started working on it, uh, right? Exactly. So 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 labor and transformation and so-called production is a source of wealth there's no doubt about that in fact if you and i exchange two things you know i exchange my my apple for your pear we haven't really created any new matter or any new things in the world but we have increased the sum total of wealth in the world because we're now both better off after right, right. so that's almost a perfect illustration of how um, a voluntary transaction or labor or action can increase wealth but it doesn't create new property titles Property titles only come from original appropriation or, or contract. Have you had a discussion with anybody who has said there are other ways of acquiring property other than, um, I mean, forgetting the creation type idea, but but other than, you know, first appropriation uh, and, and the other ones that you listed? Have you ever, like, had a socialist, for instance, come along and say, well, no, actually the state owns everything <laughs> or something like that? Have you ever had that kind of discussion? I don't think that explicitly, um, usually because they're a little bit leery of the idea of property. They don't want to really admit that they're in favor of property rights anyway, um, not so clearly. <laughs> yeah. Even, although although well, everyone is. is theft, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, every system, is, um, every system is a property system because they ultimately decide who gets to use a given resource. Yeah. So the question is, is only is the, are the allocation rules of that system just or legitimate or, or can, can you come up with a reasonable explanation of it or an argue, can you argue in favor of it coherently? And they just don't try to do that. And, you know, you'll hear the – well, the, the, uh, the uh, democracy settled it. You know, the people want this. They show this through the will of – through the representatives in the legislature, and they've decided – you know, the, these kind of arguments. But I don't really regard them as serious. They're sort of avoiding the issue or they're assuming assuming their their position. Yeah. It's, it's hard to find anyone that will actually <laughs> confront what you're actually saying and – discuss the actual points that you're saying rather than just asserting something different what, what i find is the most common thing they resort to uh conservatives especially but sometimes socialists if you push push them they will begrudgingly admit that they favor they value liberty too like we do so that they characterize us as favoring liberty and only liberty Ah, it, like, liberty it's is the only, only value. It's your only value, and right, they say we right. value liberty too. It's just not our only value. Yeah, but to me, that's just a dishonest way of of explaining that sometimes you're in favor of non liberty or aggression. I mean, but a criminal could say the same thing. You know, I, I a, yeah. a guy trying to <laughs> attack someone it could say, "Look, I yeah. generally favor liberty, but in this particular case." <laughs> I really want to do the following thing, and that requires me to put a hole in your body. Um, <laughs> and so in this case, I, I'm not a simple monist, uh, simple-minded person like you with only one value. I have many values. That's really what the conservatives and the, and the socialists end up saying. They, they, And I think actually it's a straw man because we libertarians um, – and this goes to the thick, thin debate, which you've probably followed. Um, yeah. Um, it it, it, it it strawmans us by assuming that we're all radically thin in the way the thickers strawman the thinners, if, I, if that makes sense. Yeah, your only value is liberty. The, the, the thick advocates like – yeah, 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 the thick advocates want to incorporate these other values as part of libertarianism or something like that. They, they're all over the map. Um, but, the, but the presumption of that attempt is that… If you if you don't incorporate it into libertarianism, you don't have these other values. But to my mind, libertarianism is just one discipline or one part of your life among many. No one is just a libertarian. We all have other values. 
But we do happen to believe that aggression is wrong. I mean, that is one thing we believe, just like most people believe murder is wrong. Um, so it's one thing we believe, and we elaborate that. Um, and you just can't undercut that by saying that's all you believe in because it's not true. You can't undercut it by saying that it's, all, it's your only value. Um, I think Robert Nozick's phraseology was good. Felicitous here. He said that you know rights are – we view them as side constraints, things that – um, they really are like an, a, an absolute veto over certain possible considerations of what's a good pol policy or law. Uh, you could have it A, B, and C, but if it involves murdering someone, that's simply not permissible because we think that's unjustifiable. Uh, and look, y you can argue with us. You can say, look, I favor the state because I believe murder is good, but they don't want to say that. They want, they want to say, well, we believe in liberty, but we believe in other things too, unlike you simple-minded libertarians. <laughs> So that's the that's the tactic I find them using most often. Right. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. So another question I've got for you: um, What are your current interests in terms of personal study? Well, history is one. I, I I have a deficit in my knowledge of history. I've sort of had to learn it on my own because I was again I was an engineer and I'm from Louisiana and the U.S., which doesn't have the best um, uh, undergrad. I mean, uh, high school and secondary education system so i've learned history on my own so i'm always trying to read more history and and, and learn, learn more about it um so I, I love history i'm reading two or three books on that now um i'm also reading crevel's book um on the state which is fascinating um um not heard of that what is that Oh, it's uh, Martin Va Martin Van Creveld, and he's by the way speaking this year. He's an older gentleman now. He's, a, he's an Israeli scholar, I think. He's um, I think it's called the the rise and decline of the state or something like that. Um, uh, he has a thesis which I and I rejected when my friends described it. He says basically the state is a modern the state is a modern institution. Yeah, it's only been around for about you know three three hundred years, and. I, I at first rejected that because as a libertarian, we define the state differently than I think a political scientist like he would. Yeah. Um, for us, the state is just any institutionalized use of force, and by that definition, even in Rome, there was a state. Right. But by the modern definition of the state, I think he's I think he's correct. There, the, the, there's something changed in the nature of the state. It became sort of an independent. Uh, administrative bureaucratic agency with an independent personality. Like a corporate personality, like in the uh, I don't know, sixteen hundred, something like that. Um, so this would be separate. like the nation state. Is the nation state, yeah. and it's separate from the, separate from the identities of the current administrators of yeah. it, which is which is, and I think the, the powerful aspect of that what line of thinking is that once you understand that aspect of the state, it puts a damper on this political activism that a lot of libertarians get into because they think that if you vote for Obama, if you vote for Ron Paul or if you vote for A over B you you put a different president or a different congressman in the office or whatever it's going to make a difference but it really won't because they're just temporary caretakers of the office yeah I mean, it's the office that's the problem it's not the and holder it's not just the, and it's not just the office it's the administrative bureaucracy that exists outside of the administration itself or, or as you say and i think in england i think you guys the word you you use the word government like we use the word administration here yeah that's right yeah, yeah you're forming a new government yeah whereas libertarians tend to use the word government to be synonymous with the word state yeah. which i think is an, which is another confusion yeah. um so the Obama administration comes in. They change the administrative agencies, but of course the heads of the bureaucracies and the and the legislative people they all stay intact. They're just functionaries. Yeah. They're the real they're the real state. Uh, and just like in England, you know, if Parliament can't decide on a new government or a new administration, as we would say, um, the, the the state still exists in the background, right? Yeah. yeah. Or even in the U.S., when they say the government, the federal government has a shutdown. Yeah. It doesn't really shut down, so it's a bizarre. It's a bizarre thing. So I think that that sort of can open our eyes as to the futility of um, electoral politics. It, the solution is not to elect the right people. Yeah, I think. Absolutely. So, okay. So, this, I'm sorry I interrupted you. You were saying something about this book. You were studying this book, and you well, first no, you said, asked, uh, you, "Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead." I'm oh, sorry. Well, you, the first thing you said about the book was that you, when you first heard about it, you rejected the theory. I did because I, I, I said it's ridiculous to say that there was no state until right. 1600 because there's always been states. But I was – that's just a semantic. I think that's just a definitional thing. It depends on how you define the word state. Right, okay. 
So in, in our sense, the state has been around ever since the dawn of mankind in a, in, in a sense. But the modern state does have a particular feature which is fairly recent. I, I do believe that's that's correct. And I think that complements in a way Hans Hermann Hoppe's um, sort of a contrarian democracy thesis, his, 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 uh, his idea where he challenges even people like Rothbard and Mises, right, who, who sort of went along with the Western liberal idea that – yeah, the modern Western liberal democratic republican state idea of America and Western Europe uh, is not perfect, and it's not perfectly libertarian, but it was an improvement over the monarchies before, which was an improvement over uh, previous uh, systems. Yeah, And what he said was he thinks that they had – like he said, even Rothbard, who was about the most radical and the first radical libertarian systematic thinker, I think, um, they had a soft spot for democracy in the American sort of Western – European approach, right. and he, he he sort of has a contrarian position, which he says we shouldn't assume that the move from monarchy around World War One time to the modern democratic state was was unalloyed, uh, you know, w- Whiggist progress. Right. It, it may have been it may have been a retrogression, at least in some ways. Oh, I think and, it was. I I think it totally was, and I'm totally with the idea. If you have a you have a king or a dictator, or someone like that, you can see who the evil. You can see where the evil comes from. You know your enemy, and yeah, you it, might, and you might get a good you might get a good king every now and then. It's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in a democracy, and if you have a bad one, if you have a bad one, they're only there for a short time, and they could be killed. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. And plus, they could probably only be the king of so much of a territory, so you could leave if you had to. Yeah, you couldn't. You couldn't really imagine the king of of a North American territory that large. It would be hard to imagine. Usually, they're smaller territories oh i think obama can imagine it <laughs> i think i think maybe hamilton too could have imagined yeah <laughs> but i think now another aspect of democracy is is it's it's um yeah the people who live there under this system um in a in, uh, under a monarchy or a dictator um they know that the enemy is over there in a democracy that it's their friends it's their family it's themselves it's you know and uh, no one can quite put a finger on exactly where it's all coming from because it's you you, yeah you know what i mean down my leg diarrhea is a rummy thing you feel like expressing your appreciation but you just don't know how it will come out no drama anti-diarrhea tablets remove that anxiety I say Camilla that chili con carne of yours is really rather good no drama anti-diarrhea tablets that you fart with confidence and dignity Is your child defiant, independent, annoyingly inquisitive? After a long, hard day of following the rules, who wants to deal with troublesome kids? 49% of children suffer from Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. Symptoms of ODD include independent thought, rampant creativity, and failure to submit to authority. But now there's a solution. The good people at Pilfer can help you with their time-release, once-daily capsule, Compliacin. Your child won't be able to form his own opinions, let alone express them. It maintains your child's ability to go to a state-run school and perform simple tasks around the house. You won't have to worry about parenting, and the school won't have to deal with your kid asking questions. Compliacin. You'll go from this. Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! Quit telling me what to do! To this. Good morning, Mother. I love going to school. And this week we're learning all about how the government is our federal family and they're here to help us. Compliacin. Talk to your school psychiatrist and ask for it by name. Warning, this commercial was produced by Michael and Deborah Jean Dean of the Freedom Fiends. Find out more at freedomfiends.com. The BBC News. The BBC Radio 4 programme, You and What's Left After We've Taken Our Fair Share of What You Earned, is running a competition 
that anyone who hates their fellow men and women can enter. A spokesman for the programme said, As you know, the subtitle of our programme is There Ought to Be a Law. Well, in recent times, even the topmost curtain twitchers at the BBC are having a hard time conceiving of new regulations that haven't already been implemented. So we thought we'd ask the great British public for help. Are you aware of any area of life that, that isn't covered by an existing regulation? If so, you, you could win a seat at the next recording of Sit at Their Feet and get to put your case for it. So come on now, get out those grievances and petty annoyances and let's see if we can't make this country even more intolerant. <laughs> In other news, one of the World Cup matches has ended, and we have a score? 4-2. That's the end of this news bulletin. What, what are your, what are you, let me ask you a question. What, what are your thoughts on the immigration sort of uh, uh, controversy among... In the states more, at the uh, moment? No, 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 not that. I, I just mean among the theoretical controversy among anarchist libertarians, where you know Hoppe, um, Hoppe had these sort of um, uh, uh, contrarian opinions on immigration, saying that it, uh, immigration in today's system amounts to forced integration, and then so a lot of these anarchist libertarians. So there, there is a debate there too, just like there's debates about abortion and. Okay, well, there's a couple uh, of different aspects to that in the UK. I mean, the, the two aspects I see is, are you talking about just people coming into a country from some other place? Um, and the, you know, the arguments around, do they go on state benefits or, you know, do they work or, you know, are they welcome? Should they be welcome or not welcome? That kind of thing. That's one aspect. But another aspect uh, that we've been having a lot of in the UK, and I know because you go to the property, is it property and freedom yeah, PFS, Property and Freedom Society. Right. Sure. If you go there, then you know Sean Gab, right? I do know Sean very well, yeah. Right. Okay. So one of Sean's thing that um, – and he's probably spoken about this, talking about how there was once um, – we had a tradition in, uh, in the UK or at least in England or – I think in England. I'm not exactly sure. I'm, my history in, of English, my history of these islands where I live is nowhere near <laughs> as good as my history of America. <laughs> but, Interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but we have a, you know, we've got, we've had Cobden. We've had, um, we've had a lot of libertarian, classical libertarian thinkers were British mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. our, in our history. There was a tradition of liberty in this country, and it has entire, pretty much entirely gone. It's not being taught, and uh, I think another, I mean, I don't know if this is the other aspect of immigration that you were talking about, or that, that I thought you might have meant, is that um, we've had lots of immigration from other cultures. It's not just other people coming in, but the culture mm -hmm. is different. Mm -hmm. Their traditions are different. Their ideas of rights are completely different. And uh, that's just basically serves to dilute any uh, dilutes our own traditions. Now, I'm not, you know, it's nothing to do with yeah. where you were born, or it's nothing to do with color. It's nothing to do with race. It's nothing to do with religion. Although those right. things might come into it, but it's very much to do with what are your basic beliefs? You know, how do you get along with people? And if you believe something different, <laughs> it right, and I with think the culture. that. I think there's aspects of that in the sort of paleo-anarchist, anti-immigrant view, which is that in a democratic system, in certain cultures, in certain contexts, if you, if, if you allowed open immigration, then you would very soon, as a practical matter, you would just lose the culture you had, which supports a certain degree of libertarian rights already. Yeah. Right? It's not perfect, but it, we have a certain degree of it. Uh, so that's one argument. It's a consequentialist. Pra I think Ralph Rakos argued that about Switzerland. I think that argument is less persuasive in the U.S. context itself. I think, by and large, immigrants that come here are net beneficiaries to the economy and to the culture because we have such a diverse culture already. Um, I think it could but, be said that immigrants to the states, especially a hundred years ago or up to about a hundred years ago, they were going there because of what 
because of the American culture. They wanted to be a part of that culture. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just a, a location. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get that impression too. And um, I, I suspect there's an aspect of that. Maybe not – they don't want to become English if they move to England, but I think – I would imagine people moving to England – from poorer countries, or just trying to get a better life, they're trying oh, to get a f- absolutely. job. Of course, um, they don't. May, they may not want to become English, but they uh, or British, but they uh, uh, they're probably not doing it to get on the welfare. But I, I don't no. know. May, may, maybe maybe they are. But I think that tends to be a caricature. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. These are the arguments that you get in the newspapers and whatnot. But the yeah, you know, I don't think they're very real. Anyone who's got enough gumption to leave their country and, and go through all the amazing bureaucracy that it probably takes to arrive here has probably got enough about them that they can uh, make a living you know right but if you, if you believe in open borders then you want to gr- get rid of the red tape and the difficulties so that would sort of lower that barrier and it would <laughs> make it a little bit easier for say lower quality immigrants to come in but so that's sort of the counter argument i guess against it I, i'm totally for open borders because yeah. i cannot support the state in doing anything but i understand some of the arguments that try to point out the the cost that will come with open borders in a state run system like we all have now. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I agree with you. I think I agree with you on that. Then, yeah, I can I can see cost. I can, but I but I cannot go along with the the idea that the state can can you know it just erecting a border in the first place. It just seems so outrageous. So um, let me ask you a question: Have you been to the states? I have, I've twice, yeah. Yeah, where have you visited? Uh, in eighty New York, New York, and where else? No, I've never been to New York. <laughs> I, 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 w- I would have loved to have gone to New York prior to, uh, prior to Bloomberg, <laughs> when it was still oh, possible to smoke it. there. Uh, I would have loved to have gone to New York. I'd love to have seen it, but I've never been there. Now I've been to the West Coast and I've been uh, to Florida. So. Oregon, Washington, California. Yeah, so I mean, basically six months each time, and uh, pretty much like the place, very much like the people, like lots of things that were going on there. Had a funny incident in in uh, in Los Angeles with a crossing a road and getting stopped for jaywalking, getting a ticket. Is that uh, not really a type of crime enforced in Europe very much, or just it doesn't exist in England? Doesn't okay. exist at all. Just the very idea that you can't cross a road is what? <laughs> you know? um, yeah, yeah. And at the time, I, I mean, I think I knew about it, but I thought I was going to challenge the guy anyway, and I just was in a hurry to get across the road. <laughs> but he came up to me, and uh, you know, I, I was just saying, you know, "I can't believe this. This is ridiculous. You mean you can't cross a road without permission? What is this?" <laughs> well, the, the, the worst thing about it is. Uh, you never know, like when you travel across the U.S., like I do. I, I'm never quite clear, like uh, what city, town, county, state I'm in, uh, what the laws are going to be on jaywalking or on turning right on red, oh, red light, yeah, um, or left. In your case, you know, I mean, uh, it's it, and I'm always like look, sitting there looking for a sign saying, "Is jaywalking prohibited or not here?" And I don't know. <laughs> it's it's bizarre that we're we're now running around looking for for, for permission all the time. Um, but I, w- I wouldn't want to have a centralized central state to make it uniform just to solve that problem. No. Yeah. So here's another question for you, and I pr- right. probably know the answer to this, but uh, people listening might not. What are your current interests in terms of getting the word out? So, um, well, a few things. Number one, I'm, um, I- I've been involved in Jeff Tucker's new venture, Liberty.me. So yeah. I, like I said, I did a, a seminar last night there, and one of my guides just came out, How to Do Business Without IP and Ultra Property. Uh, so Liberty.me is one thing. Um, I'm working on a book. I'm, I'm working on two books, actually. I'm working on one book, which is a, an edited selection of some of my previous articles. I'm going to call it Law in a Libertarian World, I think. That's interesting. Um, I think Hoppe is going to write the uh, introduction. That's or very the preface. interesting. Uh-huh. Um, uh, that's not much new material, but just edited and in one place because some people seem to like books still. Um, and I'm going to do a new book on IP. Um, my my against intellectual property, I think was was systematic and correct, but in the last 12 years since then or so, I've come up with a lot of different uh, 
uh, arguments and ways of presenting things and examples. And so I'm going to just do a new one from scratch. And uh, if I get if I finish it, and it's it's going to be called "Copy This Book." Um, oh, excellent! Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm working on in terms of getting the ideas out there. Um, in two, 2014, I decided because my wife has a very hectic job and um, I don't get paid a lot for a lot of these speaking gigs that I do on the side of my job. Um, I decided for 2014 as an experiment to take off the year and not do any traveling for libertarian events. Really? And I, I resisted every every invitation so far, except I finally gave in. I knew it would happen. I got invited to speak at the New York uh, Liberty Fest in, in October when my wife is out of town, and so I'm going to do that one, take my son. And uh, and then I just got invited to speak at Yale and uh, by a leftist really? to speak before a sort of moderate leftist group of undergrads with a political journal. A moderate and, leftist group at Yale? Well, they're – I don't know if they're moderate leftists. I'm just saying they're not libertarians. I, I didn't get <laughs> – I, I got invited because I'm a libertarian, but I didn't get invited by a libertarian who was just trying to promote us. They really want to hear from libertarians, and I figure – Wow. I figure I can't turn down an invitation from a university that I could not have been uh, admitted to as a student. Um, so, you know, it's my chance to go there. So I'm going to go to Yale in October as well and speak there. So I'm doing two speaking gigs this year. Um, I got invited to Russia, which was an interesting thing. Um, I got invited twice. I got invited by the Adam Smith Institute Moscow, which I was invited two or three years ago, and I couldn't go then. And I delivered my speech remotely, which I'll do this year. But then I got invited – to speak in St. Petersburg and Moscow by Esquire Magazine Russia. Wow. And, with, and they were going to pay me. It was bizarre. Uh, I was totally shocked. They wanted me to go speak on alternative legal systems from a libertarian perspective, and they were going to cover it with the media and do it in their magazine and pay me and everything. Um, but I turned it down because I was still sticking to my plan of – Oh, dear. Well, plus I'm I'm a little bit af I'm a little bit afraid of Russia. I have a I have this sneaking Ayn Rand suspicion that if I step foot on their shores, they're going to arrest me. But I know I'm not that important. But you know, I kind of think they must know I hate communism <laughs> or something. You well, know, I don't know. I hate to tell you this, but I kind of feel the same way about going to the states again. I I I, I can't uh, I can't I can't uh, argue I I can't blame I I don't feel that way, but I can't blame you. I I I commiserate. Um, I do, um, and I don't feel that way about Russia. <laughs> and, and, and you may be right. Uh, to be to be honest, I, I was also pretty sure they weren't going to pay for business class, and I don't know if I want to fly to Russia and coach. So, it's you know, a long way to go, coach. Yeah, would, yeah. I'm a, little bit, I'm a little bit spoiled too. So, uh, <laughs> so that was interesting. I thought I was, I'm like I'm not because I'm not famous. I'm just I'm well known in libertarian circles, but I'm not a famous speaker or anything. So it's interesting to start getting these invitations. Which to me shows that libertarianism is becoming a more known third alternative. Yeah. I mean, it's not a it's not a it's not a threat to them yet, but they know that it's out there. And sometimes they want to they want to hear from someone with a fresh perspective and they so they, they, they dip into our little pond and sometimes they see my name and so that, I think that's what's happening. Um, so I found that interesting. So I don't know. I I, I, I I edit libertarian papers, or I mean, the ex executive editor of libertarian papers, a journal. So um, um, I, I I do all I can do uh, as an avocation. You know, have a job on this. I have a job on the side of my <laughs> libertarian pursuits. So um, I don't I don't know how to change the world. Um, I just try to be on the right side of things for my own conscience. Yeah, that's a good statement. I like that. I like that very much. Yeah. Changing the world is uh, is not a realistic. I think you know you might be able to change the mind of someone in front of you, but, uh, well, but what, if what you've got. Me, um, sorry. What worries me about people that want to change the world is, I'm afraid that they're going to give up when they realize they can't do it. Right. Right. Um, I, I don't mind people wanting to change the world, but if if that's your driver, if that's your motivation, then you're just gonna you're gonna be a temporary. I came up with the term recently. I've talked about something. I call them way station libertarians, people that are sort of passing through yeah, libertarians yeah, yeah. in their sort of ex kind of temporary exploring struggle to figure out what they believe in. First, they're a socialist in, in, in undergraduate school, and then they flirt with the environmentalists, and then they become a libertarian, and, and then they become a neocon. I mean um, – and I won't name names right now, but I can I can think of a few classic <laughs> examples. Um, 
uh, of, of people I used to be friends with and I, I know that have done this and it's dismaying and it's it's usually because they 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 convert too quickly. Yeah. And when someone converts too quickly, I kind of get the nagging feeling that they didn't get an incremental searching, pacing, plotting, gradually awakening discovery of these ideas that they just were they were desperately searching for something to grab onto and yeah. and if that happened it's going to happen again. Yeah. No, I totally get that. And I've seen people like that too. You, you see that in religious converts kind of thing as well. I remember yes. I remember driving along a road in London after taking my daughter to school and going back home and I ran out of either I ran out of petrol or someone else had run out. One of us had run out of petrol. And and the other one sort of stopped to help I'm, i can't remember if i was the one that ran out of petrol or not it could well have been me i've done it several times but we got we got talking and one of the things that she said to me was that she had recently converted to being jewish um, yeah, yeah it was jewish which was unusual because uh it's far more frequent you, you'd, you'd meet someone in london who's just converted to islam or something like that right but um so she, she's she's recent convert, and you know that they, they they always seem to have a what's the word? Uh, uh, the, the, the Impatience. Zealot, there's a certain zealousness about zealotry. What's the word? Mm. Zealotry. Yeah, they're more zealous than someone who's been doing it all their lives, kind of thing. You know, there's, there's yeah. more apparent passion, and it's it's a lot of fire, but it's not really inspired by. As you were saying, they haven't personally evaluated every single part of the whole thing and figured it out and, and arrived at that conclusion. It's kind of like they've had some sort of conversion experience or something. Yeah, they're, they're looking for a cause. Yeah. And um, instead of the cause happening to them after the gradual accumulation of evidence or thinking that makes it just uh, obvious that this is really what I am. Yeah. Like, like I did with IP, for example. I was – I was trying for three or four or five years to find an argument for IP. I looked at, <laughs> I looked under every rock I could. I, I read article, and I actually think it made me a stronger IP opponent because I read everything I could. I read so many articles on every side, just desperately searching for someone who had figured it out and could give me a solid argument for IP. Um, and finally, I quit searching because I realized <laughs> this is just I'm looking in the wrong direction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All these other guys I'm reading make more sense, and uh, I think that's a, a more solid way to approach something. And when it finally just dawns on you that uh, you just can't deny the evidence of your eyes or your reason anymore, you know? Yeah. Okay. So how did we get to that? We, we were talking about how people convert and what? No, what was it? How did we get there? I can't remember how we got here. You know, I, I used to think someone should invent an iPhone app where you can uh, track your conversation. <laughs> uh, 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 bran branching points or whatever, and retrace it when you get God, to a certain. Wouldn't point. that be something? Yeah, yeah. Just as you and if, it could be automatic. It, can, right? You need to get a yeah. pattern on that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <man. laughs> couldn't resist. Oh well, here here's something. I don't know if you want to talk about this, but I get this question all the time. Yeah. Um, well, uh, there's two things that are related. It's the hypocrisy issue. Okay. Um, so I just had this guide published on Liberty.me. On IP, yeah, and I had to I had to uh, go back and forth with the uh, the functionaries there to make sure that it um, it didn't have a copyright notice or the copyright notice in the wrong way because um, some of my previous publishers have sometimes put copyright notices on the things I publish with them, and as a copyright as an IP lawyer, I know that they actually did it incorrectly. They they were actually legally incorrect in what they said, like if. If, if if ABC organization publishes my article and they say copyright ABC organization and I wrote the article and I send it to them and I never signed an assignment of the copyright, they actually don't own the copyright. So when they say that, they're factually wrong. Uh -huh. It doesn't make a big difference legally that they do that. It's just a mistake. It's just a, a, it's a careless mistake. But you would not believe the grief I get from this over the years because some of my IP articles have a copyright notice on there by some other organization, which is just factually incorrect. Right. And I just – oh, you're a hypocrite. You're saying there should be an IP, but you copyrighted your article or you let this group copyright it. And yeah. I, I, then I have to go through all these contorted defenses of something that is 
uh, detailed in the weeds of IP law. They don't know what they're talking about. It's irrelevant to the issue anyway, and ultimately it's an ad hominem because they're basically trying to say we don't need to listen to what you're saying because you're a hypocrite. And I'm actually not a hypocrite in that case, and even if I was, it wouldn't be relevant to the issue. So so I had to fight with these guys. I just wanted to get it straight just so I wouldn't have to go through this for another 10 years because I know when people read these articles, I'm just going to get grief from these know-nothings. And even oh, I if think, I, I, think, them, I think you'll get it anyway, but <laughs> – <laughs> I'll get it anyway, but yeah, it'll it'll go up to another level. They they always will find another thing. Yeah. Um. Um. So so that's one thing. Um. Uh, on the hypocrisy front, and the other one is I get all the time is how can you be a patent lawyer and blah 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 be opposed to it. Yeah, well, you and, defend patents, don't you? No, well, no, you, well, you you are you are acting defensively for the companies that might be attacked by other people. Well, it, yeah, it's it's a boring topic, and if. People are interested in this, this kind of career. They, if they understand it and they want to really understand it, I can explain it. But yeah. the long and short is personally I help companies defend from patents, and then I do other functional things that manipulate the system because it exists just like a tax lawyer or a CPA would or whatever. Yeah. But to me, that's not, that's not the interesting issue. Um, the other interesting issue is let's assume that the patent system is a bad idea. Let's just assume that we live in a universe – or there could be a universe where it's possible that having a patent system is not a good idea. Just a simple proposition. Yet there's one anyway, right? We can imagine that. Yeah. Now you have these highly trained, deeply knowledgeable experts in that system, which are patent attorneys. Okay. Now, do you think that it's impossible that someone who really knows the system really well would not discover – and point out that there's something wrong with the system? Uh, or if they do, do you not want them to do that? I mean, if an IRS agent one day wakes up and says the tax system is theft... Hey, a couple of them have done that, actually, haven't they? they have, of course. They have been of, course. Few, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, do you want them to remain silent? I mean, do you want only people that are ignorant of the details of the system to have a, an opinion on it? I mean, so the, the entire criticism it makes no sense. It's basically... Um, it, it, I think it's a dishonest argument. They're, they're trying to use everything they can to, to make people just shut up. So if I know a lot about the system and I criticize it, I'm more dangerous than the average, so well, yeah. they want me to shut up. It's just like a black person opposing affirmative action. like you know uh, uh, Walter Williams uh, or someone like that. Yeah, Walter Williams or the uh, uh, Clarence Thomas on the Supreme yeah. Court, uh, uh, they'll say – the, these uh, these uh, so-called liberals in the U.S. they will uh, they will use basically racist arguments um, that they used to decry. They'll say, "Well, how dare Clarence Thomas oppose affirmative action? After all, he benefited from it." Uh, and yet, and yet, uh, one of the criticisms conservatives level at affirmative action laws is that there's a stigma attached to minorities, and that you would assume that they didn't really earn their you know their their success. Yeah. Because of affirmative action, and yet – and when you make that argument, they will attack you for being racist, which I think is also wrong. <laughs> but they make the same argument because they're entitled to make it. This is one reason uh, – look, I have leftist and rightist friends on the on the libertarian side, and I, I just cannot help personally. I hate the left more than the right. I just can't help it. I know the right is more warmongering in some ways, but I just really, really, really – I hate the left. They have this smugness, this this uh, this this pretension at that they're better than the right. Yeah, and they're as bad or worse, I think. And yeah. at, at least the right doesn't really pretend that they're superior in that sort of smug sense. I don't know. I know I don't like yeah. the right either, but you know that's my take on it. I don't know what yours is, but I, agree. I just I cannot agree. stand the left. It's their unwillingness to argue. Logically, you know, un un just an unwillingness to confront an argument and, 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 and take you apart. They know they can't, I guess. Well, you, you kind of think, well, yeah, they know they can't. I don't I'd actually know whether they know they can't or not. It's just never occurred to them as a strategy that, uh, you know, to point out any faults in your real argument. That just, you know, it's like they'd rather just try and get people to not listen to you. <laughs> right, and I think that's partly because they know their arguments aren't working, and they just want to use their current domination of the system, their yeah. power, yeah. to 
they don't really need to argue because they're they're basically in control. They they pretty much won, I think, in a way. Yeah, yeah. And no. So also, I think they are stupider in the sense that they are they're not as economically literate, oh, and they are uh, they're more emotivist, right? They're more yeah. emotional driven. A lot of conservatives, at least, do have some appreciation for economics. They're, I think, the conservatives' big problem is they don't have a system, and they're not consistent, which is the human failing. Yeah. So conservatives. So I can see why libertarians tend to think that our natural al- allies are the are the right sometimes. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know what your thoughts are on it. But I, I yeah, uh, it's a sometimes thing. It's definitely not an always thing. <laughs> Anything else you want to talk about? I've I've I've, I've uh, I'm out of questions. <laughs> well, we didn't talk about tobacco. Oh my god, we must talk about tobacco. <laughs> my god, <word>. proper tea. <laughs> Well, tell me about. I mean, hey, this is this is fascinating. I've learned that uh, said it was Nima, and he mentioned uh, Sheldon Richmond, and now you come out of the woodwork as well. I wonder who else. Well, and I didn't. A- I, I didn't even know that Sheldon smoked. Uh, I I met Sheldon in San Diego. I mean, I've known him for years, you know, over the internet. But I we 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 had a we went to Libertopia about two years ago, and uh, we had lunch lunch together, and we met his wife and. I just didn't know he smoked a pipe, um, and I was then. I've been smoking uh, cigars for uh, 15 years and then a pipe for maybe five years, and uh, I've enjoyed it. I haven't been a connoisseur like you and Nima have been, but uh, but I also found that the habit started getting to be um, – it wasn't a habit for me, but it was more like just the ritual and just the um, uh, keeping up with everything. You know, I, uh, it, Maybe it's just my age or my time in life. I'm 48, and uh, – for some reason, in the last six months, I've noticed I don't really drink coffee that much anymore. And I know you like tea, but I just I like the, coffee. The, 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 the morning caffeine habit has sort of waned with me at least really? lately, and also the uh, the desire to smoke uh, just to keep up with the tobacco. Um, so now I'm lately of the mind that I don't want to have a humidor. I don't want to have all that stuff but paraphernalia i might go get a nice cigar every now and then because you can do that with cigars yeah it's just you don't have to have a pipe yeah you don't have to have anything you just go buy a cigar and you can smoke it you know what i mean yeah um i just wish there were cigars that were more like pipes because the only cigars i've ever found that are aromatic are all these these el cheapos we call them here you know they're they really yeah i don't under, why don't they make good pipes good cigars that are like pipes you know with an, a nice good tobacco aromatic Oh dear. Um, flavor. I can't understand that. That is that's that's the most appalling heresy I've ever heard. <laughs> tell tell me why. Uh well in my experience the, the people who are the most those that consider themselves connoisseurs tend to like tobacco and and they like the flavour of tobacco. So they smoke for tobacco. It's not it's not um I understand. They don't I care understand. about what it smells like to other people. Yeah, but there are blends um, for even even for pipes. You have a blend that you prefer, right? And, and maybe not aromatic, but there's a blend, right? There are many blends that I like. Yeah, yeah, there are many. And there, and there are some that I prefer above above others. But I avoid aromatics. And uh, the only so if you of, smoke a pipe, you don't you don't smoke like cherry flavored or apple no, flavored. No, absolutely right? not. Okay, no. okay, all right, all right. Well, you see, I told you I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not I'm not a deep no. Well, the, like, to be honest, I mean that could be. I don't know. I mean, that that could just be a fashion, or it might. I'm not, I'm not sure. No, but no. Let, let, let me give you one thing you might not have thought of, which may be a slight argument in my favor, in my <laughs> defense. Um, my wife and other women, I've noticed, yeah, much prefer the up, aromatic they, ones. They put up with. They will complain about a a cigar, even a good cigar. Yeah, not too much, but they will complain. But if they smell a man smoking a cherry pipe or something, yeah. They say, "Oh, that smells pretty good," you know. Uh, yeah. So it's a way of keeping the wifely bitching down. Yeah, yeah. That, no, that's totally true. That's a very good <laughs> argument. <laughs> I mean, hey, what can you say? Amazing. So who else could be? A pipe? It could be an argument for having no. Uh, let's see, who else smokes a pipe uh, in, in our movement? Um, I've always thought Jeffrey Tucker ought to. Jeff is a cigarette smoker, and I've never been a cigarette that's, smoker. Oh, uh, that's you just... know. Or, or even a marijuana. I don't inhale, so I don't even smoke marijuana. You know. Right. So, um, but I have tried e-cigs recently. Um, they're they're surprisingly, technologically, amazingly good. I've heard but this think, from a few people now, and and I, I think they're better some. for 
they're they're primarily good for cigarette smokers who want to quit because you can get your nicotine fixed without the tar, right? Yeah. But if if you're a pipe smoker or a cigar smoker like I was and you are, you do it primarily for the ritual and for the for the taste and and if you use an e-cig for that, it just doesn't work well because you're going to burn out the battery or it's just it just doesn't work cuz it's not about the taste. Uh-huh. You know. Um there's a guy named T. Franklin Harris who was an old libertarian friend of mine. I think he's a pipe smoker. I don't know if you probably don't know him, but I don't know. I'm not part of – most of my pipe and cigar smoking friends are not libertarians, so uh, okay. I don't know who, who to mention there. Um, well, it's interesting. I mean one of the um, – probably the main reason I became a libertarian – well, it's not a main reason, but the main thing that kind of uh, led me towards finding out about it was through smoking. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Basically, and it was around about 2000. Yeah, 2000. Um, we had had laws in the UK for many years. I mean, since the 70s, there had been warnings on cigarette packs and tobacco packs mm-hmm. and things like that. Mm-hmm. But it always said things like, you know, smoking might be damaging to your health. Okay. Maybe damaging. So okay, all right. That was that. That sounded reasonable to me, right? and it was it was kind of acceptable. And I thought, okay, fine, you know. And uh, two thousand, um, my wife was pregnant with my first daughter, and I thought, well, I ought to investigate this smoking luck, see if it's okay or not. You know, should I be doing it? Shouldn't I be doing it? And what? And I decided to you know just study up on it and find out. And I went to um, the most nanny the most uh, hysterical organization that I know of on the planet, which is called ASH, Mm A-S-H. There is an American version, but the UK version is unbelievable. I mean, (laughs) they are so hysterical. It's quite incredible. And I went direct to them to find out all about it because I figured, you know, know, they're, they're shouting the loudest. They probably got some evidence. So, yes, they have some evidence, but it's buried under mountains and mountains of claims that are not backed up by the evidence yeah so and as a so as a result of that I, I i started to study these things and started to study um things like epidemiology mm-hmm. oh gosh it's 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 all quite complex stuff um but as a result i mean i, I basically figured that you know that they were shouting way above what the evidence was really saying you know Yes, there may well be some dangers, but there's, there's no... I mean, what, what about the thing that changed in 2000 was that the labels changed. It no longer said, you know, smoking may damage your health. It now said, smoking kills. <laughs> okay, just yeah, straight Yeah, right? I've seen those. And I thought, yeah, it's, oh, come yeah. on, that's a bit outrageous. That's, yeah, it's almost like the uh, the German laws that say you can't deny the Holocaust. Like, I mean, the, the, the government's officially establishing a fact that no one can challenge, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Not that I'm a Holocaust denier, but I'm just saying right. it's it's it's, un- it's uncomfortable. The government's uh, assuming the role of policing thoughts, policing um, truth. Yeah, really. Yeah, listen. Um, you I, I don't want to cut you short, but my next one is starting right now. Um, I I enjoyed it. I'd love to uh, chat with you again. Great. And, uh, give, me, give me some websites and things that uh, people can find you on. Um, probably the best site is just my name, Stefan. Kinsella.com. Kinsella is Irish, by the way, so it's K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A, <laughs> pronounced Kinsella over there. And Stefan with an A, S-T-E-P-H-A-N. So StefanKinsella.com. We'll, we'll have uh, all my stuff there. Okay. Thanks a lot, Stefan. It's been really great having you on. That's brilliant. Thanks a lot. I've enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Have a good, good evening. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. If you've been affected by any of the issues discussed in this programme, a couple of hours on BBC Radio 4 will soon have you forgetting all about rights and all that other nonsense.